Council Economic Development Meeting. Pleased to be joined by my colleagues, uh, Vice Chair Kikorian, Member Koretz, Member Wizar, Member Martinez, and Member Council President Wesson. <clears throat> There's been a lot of interest in dialogue uh, since uh, over this past uh, week or 10 days since uh, we approved uh, our request to have the city attorney draft a minimum wage ordinance, an ordinance that we're going to be discussing today. Needless to say, this is a historic action, uh, not just in our city, uh, but really across this country. In L.A., we have a, we're struggling with a growing poverty crisis. Housing costs continue to rise, and yet we have some of the lowest wages in the country. This proposal takes wages in L.A. to $15 by 2020 for most businesses and by 2021 for smaller establishments and nonprofits with fewer than 25 employees. Uh, even, if, even at this rate, it's going to leave our lowest paid workers earning some $31,000 a year, still an amount that's very challenging to live on in Los Angeles. But we believe this is an important step in the right direction that's going to help us lift more than 600,000 600, residents out of poverty. And it's going to inject our local economy uh, with some $6 billion in increased wages. They're going to be spent here locally uh, on Main Street, not Wall Street. That being said, a policy this broad deserves ample discussion. Uh, it's, an, it's inevitable as we see the final ordinance on paper. New issues are going to emerge as they have. Uh, but I want to assure you that we're going to make sure that all these issues are thoroughly discussed uh, and vetted. Uh, so without further ado, let's have the city attorney uh, present us uh, members uh, with the ordinance that they've prepared. Let's hold our questions until they've wrapped up their presentation. Uh, then we will take public comment, and then members, if there are any amendments we want to make, I will, we can consider them at that time. Uh, so if there's no objection, let's uh, ask our... Yes, uh, Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce this motion, the matter before us? Number one, city attorney report and ordinance relative to adding Article 7 to Chapter 18 of the Municipal Code requiring a minimum wage for employees and amending the title of Chapter 18 of the Municipal Code. Thank you. You may proceed. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Valerie Flores. I'm a senior assistant city attorney, and I'm here with uh, Dave Michelson, who is our civil branch chief. Uh, Last week, we transmitted um, two ordinances to uh, the city council. One establishes a minimum wage in the city, and the other establishes um, an enforcement bureau or division that will be housed in the Bureau of Contract Administration um, to uh, investigate and uh, make determinations regarding wage claims. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you have about the ordinances. No uh, yeah. No, you have, no, questions you have a question, Mr. You have a question, Mr. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. What's going to be the impact uh, on other wage ordinances, uh, such as those for hotels uh, and, and contractors. Uh, how is this ordinance going to affect that? Um, under well-settled principles of statutory construction, a court likely would look at the three ordinances and um, will attempt to harmonize them and give effect to all three. And under those same rules of statutory construction, ordinances that are more specific will prevail over ordinances that are general if there's a conflict. So for example, for hotel employers, our hotel minimum wage ordinance is more specific. And so a hotel uh, employer will be governed by the hotel minimum wage ordinance, not the general city minimum wage ordinance. Okay. Members, any questions? Uh, Mr. Wiesar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, that's, the, that's a legal response to what would happen should this go into a court of law. But in terms of us being aware of what those conflicts are up front and setting out a path for us so that we could reconcile those conflicts, yes, I will. 
Um, have we done that? Are we going to do that? Or are we just waiting for somebody to sue us? I mean, are we going to do that up and, 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 and preempt that? You raise a good point, council members, and one of the things this body may, may want to do is forward a recommendation to full council to ask us to amend the citywide hotel minimum wage ordinance and the city contractor living wage ordinance to make those ordinances clear that they supersede any citywide minimum wage. That would provide, you know, belt and suspenders notice to employers that they will continue to be governed by the more specific ordinance. Yeah. And so, but, but we haven't identified what those points of contentions are now, correct? For example, one of them is CPI. I think they're on two different tracks. So um, prior to us adopting the citywide, we have to ask ourselves and be very clear, you know, what are we going to want to have it supersede? And if it's just a legal approach, which is the most specific one, we can do that. But if it's the policy one, which is we want to make one more specific than the other, we want to follow one and emphasize one, I think we could do that up front as a policy matter. But I don't think we've taken that step in this process to do that and to avoid, I think, potential litigation. We should probably, at some point before council adopts this, uh, have that a bit more clear. And, and somebody needs, whether it's a CLA, CAO, with the city attorney's office, advise this committee and the council what are those points of contention? What are our options with each one of those? And which direction do we want to go as a policy matter, not, not, as, a, not as a legal matter? Um, because there might be some things in the hotel or the, the citywide living way, uh, minimum wage that we want to take precedence, precedence over the other. So, Mr. Chair, that's something that we should be aware of as, as we move forward, I, I believe, before, prior to adopting this, because that would um, uh, avoid any potential litigation or minimize uh, the, any potential litigation in the future, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Thank you, Councilman. Any other questions, members? Mr. Wesson? You know, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, when we get towards the action part of the committee, uh, I probably would suggest that we uh, make a request of the city attorney to uh, clarify that to look into that and to make sure that our language language is such that the existing uh, uh, agreements stay, you know, together. I don't think it was the spirit or intent of this council to change those. So at the end of the day, I think we might want to consider that request and then have, bring it before the full council. Okay. okay. We can do that. Any other questions at this point, members? Okay, let's take uh, public comment. I think we've got several cards. We're going to ask, again, speakers to uh, keep your comments to one minute so that we can uh, hear f from as many as we can as quickly as we can. Um, Jonathan Klein, Sophia Chung, Melda Padilla, Rusty Hicks, Edgar Gonzalez, please. You'll come to the microphone and Hi, I'm Elda Padilla, but I would like to give my minute over to uh, Rusty Hicks. Uh, good morning, uh, committee. Good afternoon, committee. Uh, my name is uh, Rusty Hicks, uh, Executive Secretary Treasurer of the LA County Federation of Labor. You know, for six months, uh, the Raise the Wage Coalition have stood before you and argued for a $15 minimum wage. Last week, the City Council made history by calling for an ordinance to live, lift three quarters of a million people out of poverty. You know, two, two years ago, the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank found that California's low wage workforce have a life expectancy of 5.6 years shorter than those in the middle class. So raising and enforcing the wage in the city of LA isn't just about a living wage, it's actually about the length of life itself. The council will soon consider a uh, provision for earned sick days so that people can see a doctor when they're sick. The council may also consider a provision that protects agreements between workers and their employers to ensure that workers reach a middle class life. 
Recent news stories suggest that there is something underhanded, somehow hypocritical about our efforts. This simply isn't a secretive way to incentivize workers to organize, or is it, nor is it a, a way to pay union workers less than they deserve. This is about staying consistent with previous provisions and crafting something that with, will withstand legal scrutiny and delay. I'd, of course, love for everyone in L.A. to join a union, to have the benefit of a collective bargaining agreement, but you shouldn't have to belong to a union to see the benefits of hard work. And L.A. shouldn't have please, to please, wait to get a raise. Please summarize your, your comments. So uh, certainly you'll have time to consider these additional provisions, and we support that. But we should all ensure that this policy is good as the others the city has already adopted. And we look forward to working with the council uh, to bring about the best public policy for the city of L.A. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi Jonathan Klein, clergy and lady, United for Economic Justice, and of course, uh, I think that uh, you know recent headlines and approaches uh, be damned. They're a distortion of the truth of what we're trying to do here, which is to really raise standards across the board. We know that the impact of this policy will have uh, greater repercussions even than the city of Los Angeles. You know that as well. We need to see it through the finish line. We need to create a strong, as strong a policy because we know that others are looking at this and will bend to the weakest possible direction if given the opportunity to. And we know that this is a just and, and really I would use the word righteous policy. We must continue to do justly, love mercy, and, and um, walk with God in all of our steps. You already know that. Let's get it done without exemptions, without all the distortions that are being suggested in the 11th hour. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sophia Chang. I'm with the Restaurant Opportunity Center of Los Angeles. We're a nonprofit worker center in Los Angeles um, for restaurant workers. Rock supports $15 with enforcement, and we want to thank the entire Economic Development Committee for your leadership in making this a reality. We're really close. I wanted to speak a little bit on the service charge issue. Um, for Rock, we work with non-union restaurant food service workers. Every day we have people calling our office who are referred from the Labor Commissioner's office. We know that in LA there's an 82 percent violation rate of wage an hour and across the US the Department of Labor has found that there's an 84 percent violation rate after an investigation of 9,000 full service restaurants. So we really support consistency on the service charge issue with other policies the city has passed because um, given a lot of the violation and wage theft, we're really concerned about transparency. Our main concern is that workers are really benefiting from any type of tips and service charges and that it's not being pocketed. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hey everyone, uh, my name is Sergio Gonzalez. Uh, my partner and I both work for McDonald's. The minimum wage, the minimum wage increase is life changing. The increase to $15 will help us a lot in taking care of our one year old daughter. Fast food workers have been clear from day one that they have been for $15 in the union. And we're incredibly committed to making sure workers at franchisees can benefit from this new law and that anti-discrimination protections are enforced. Corporations like McDonald's, Subway, Domino's make billions of dollars but hide behind their franchisees like mine. The franchise is backed financially by these huge corporations, unlike a small business. They can afford to pay us 15, and that's why I fight for 15 and a union. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, please, uh, Brenda Smith, Fatima Mureta, Jose Paz. Martha Jones and Martha Sanchez, please. Please come forward. Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Smith, and I like to say 
I'm here on the behalf of LTCW. And I'm a mother of eight. And I've been here before. I work as a caregiver. I make $9.65 an hour. I work two jobs. I have eight children. Out of the eight, four of them are attending college. I would like to continue to be able to pay for them to go to college. But if I receive $15 an hour, I don't need two jobs. I wouldn't have to work two. I could be at home to be a better mother. To be a better mother, because if I'm out all the time, I can't really maintain my home. So and what I'm saying is, in the, in, throughout the nation, this is a movement. This is a movement of a victorious event. And I want to congratulate all of you because you all are empowered to make this happen, to make it happen. So I would like to say, Irene, si se puede, we want it now. Oh, thank, thank you. Please. Let's try to exercise some restraint with the enthusiasm. Good afternoon. My name is Marta Sanchez. I'm with ACE and part of the Coalition to Raise the Wage. I want to encourage you to continue with the negotiations and the efforts that were first established to protect the hardworking families. We are not only establishing a precedent, uh, other people are looking for us to continue the efforts and follow the direction that we are taking in Los Angeles. So I want you to consider that even though uh, business owners are feeling so afraid of doing this, they should not be afraid of doing the right thing and to protect the hardworking families. The city is doing uh, the moving to the right direction, and for you to take in the leadership to protect the hardworking families that have no union representation will be the best effort that you will do as a council members. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you so much for thinking and the families that are going to be benefit for this ordinance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Martha Jones, and I am here with Unite Here Local 11. I am a banquet server and I support $15 with enforcement. I've been a banquet server for 15 years. I've never gotten rich off my base pay and tips, but as a single mom, I have supported myself and put three children through college. I fought hard against the restaurant's industry attempt to create a sub minimum wage through total compensation. And now I learn of a service charge will be included to the wage. This is even worse than the first attempt. We will no longer receive tips because our guests won't know that the money isn't going to us. Service charge is for service. It is not the job of the customer to pay our wages. This is an assault on my family and thousands of banquet service throughout the city. No cap on wages or service charge. Thank you. My name is Fatima Murrieta. I'm a resident of the 10th district. As a server for four years, I support 1525 with enforcement. I support a comprehensive policy that protects thousands of workers, including myself, who struggle every day to make ends meet. Thank you, council members, for your work in moving this policy forward. We've come very far. But I'm here today to tell you that these essential protections, the spirit of this policy is not up for negotiation. As the New York Times editorial board strongly noted last week, the restaurant industry has been nothing but coddled. They're an industry that has come to regard itself as entitled to special dispensation. Restaurant owners, you are not exempt from treating workers with respect. Why is this industry being coddled while my wages are being lowered? My expenses are not being lowered. My rent is higher than ever. Council members do the right thing, raise the wage with strong enforcement without a cap on my wages. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, next up, Michelle Elim, Rosemary Martinez, Jose uh, Osana, Osana, um, Marlene Ruiz, and Russell Morell.
Good afternoon, uh, committee members. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you all on the hard work you have all done in raising the minimum wage here in Los Angeles. My name is Jose Osuna, Director of Employment Services for Homeboy Industries, and I want to use my one minute to tell a brief story. Uh, as Director of Employment Services, I've helped many men and women that have come out of prisons and come out of the gang life uh, get in, gain full employment. I've never sought out a minimum wage job for anybody that comes outside of our program. Um, I don't want the number of people that I'm able to help to be limited um, without an exemption for Homeboy Industries 18-month trainees. Um, we're only asking for an exemption for those individuals that are receiving not only a paycheck but are receiving a, a bunch of additional support services uh, which include therapy, job training, uh, uh, parenting classes, anger management classes, all of these things that give them a foundation to be able to come outside of Homeboy Industries and hold an above minimum wage job. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mariana Ruiz, and I'm here to ask you to support the motion 4D. At Homeboy Industries, it has never been about the pay. It's always been about the priceless opportunities that they've given us. They've helped me to get my GED, my driver's license, They've, put, they've helped me go through college. You cannot put a price on any of these things. They also paid for the GED and the driver's license. They've helped me form a strong foundation in my recovery as a recovering addict and form a strong support group. They've even helped me to build some parenting skills to, to make better choices for my child as a parent to shape his chances. You cannot, you cannot put a price on my child's chances on his future. Homeboy Industries is the only place that opened up the doors for me and gave me these opportunities. Thank you. My name is Russell McNeil, and I'm here on behalf of Homeboy Industries and in support of Motion 4D. Um, I've done 12 and a half years just recently, and I've been out three years, and the first, the first 15 months of my life was hard. I ran across Homeboy Industries. I've learned how to better myself. I've learned how to care about myself. I've watched mothers, fathers, single parents, people of addiction come through and better themselves and go to get education, go to college, receive certificates to where they can go back out to society and better, and better themselves and be a product of the community and not a problem. I am a pillar of my community and not a product of my community, and it's because of Homeboy Industries and everything that they have to offer. I'm here before you with pride and respect for everyone inside myself. Thank you. Good morning, respected council members. My name is Rosemary Martinez. I'm a home care worker and a member of SEIU United Long-Term Care Workers. I'm here in front of you today to ask you to support in raising the minimum wage in Los Angeles to $15 an hour. For me personally, that would impact my life in a positive way. I would be able to buy goods and services that I currently cannot afford at the current wage. I, um, and just like me, there's thousands of other families that would also benefit from this by increasing the minimum wage. We will increase um, and earn money that would improve our buying power, stimulate the local economy, and by that, it would help small businesses too. In order for me to currently pay my bills and make ends meet as a single mother, I have to work at least two jobs. But I'm not alone. There are other families and single parents that also have to work two jobs, which means their children are not being attended and getting the attention they deserve to thank, be good thank and you. successful citizens. Thank you. Thank you for your, t your comments. <laughs> Marlene Otrieros, Miguel Lugo, Ricardo Paco, Nicole Shenanigan, and Ruben Gonzalez. Good afternoon. It's Marlena Ontiveros. Thank you, Marlene. I represent Homeboy Industries. Um, I would like for you guys to please support the Motion 4D because I believe everybody that walks through the doors of Homeboy Industries deserves a chance, a second chance in life. Um, if it wasn't for Homeboys, um, I have a federal case um, got refiled on me. Um, I'm with the state um, also. 
um, I've lost my children behind it, but because of homeboys being my family and my support, helping me go through parenting and helping me um, go through substance abuse classes to help me regain the custody of my children, um, it's a very special place to me. That's my family. And I would like other people to give, be given a chance to go to Homeboy Industries to reconcile their life and be given a second chance. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Miguel Lugo. I showed up to Homeboy's Industry after 18 years of being incarcerated. I was a former lifer. And uh, I went there at 18, so I spent half of my life there. And it's, it's hard because I, I never knew how hard society was going to be. I never knew how to pay a bill. I never knew how to, how to fill up a job application. I, I didn't have a GED. I didn't have nothing. Thanks to homeboys, now I got a GED. I got a driver's license. I'm, I'm going to be enrolling for solo panel so I can have a career, so I can have a life, so I can have a future out here as a regular member of society. So I'm asking you guys to so please support 4D. This makes a big difference for people like myself that comes out without knowing what we're going to do. All I knew before was gangs. It wasn't about drugs. All I knew was gangs. I grew up with gangs. Now I'm a different man. I'm a changed man, and I'm trying to be part of society, so please help us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ricardo Paco. I'm also a part of the 18-month program at Homeboy Industries. I've been there for two and a half months. Um, they've given me so much to me, nothing that uh, I've ever received from no other program. I've been in so many other programs. You know, I've, I've done so many mistakes in my life and been in, in different programs, but I guess because of me also, I've never took advantage of it. Well, I never felt like if, if uh, they would put the effort that Homeboy is, is putting into me. I never imagined myself, you know, enrolling in college. And here I am. I got my proof right here. I'm enrolled in college right now. Something I never imagined. What Homeboys has done for me, it's, it's priceless, like I've said it before. It's priceless. Something that nobody would ever, ever do for me. Thank you. That's it. Good afternoon, Nicole Shahanian with the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. The Hollywood Chamber is one of the first business organizations to support an increase in the minimum wage, provided we could do so responsibly with concrete steps to mitigate adverse effects to the small business community. We were disheartened to learn of last minute attempts to include an exemption for collective bargaining agreements. We have just spent the last eight months engaged in a process to collectively study and advocate for our beliefs. <clears throat> regarding how the wage increase should be handled in the city. Throughout hours of hearings, public comment, comments, studies, and po the potential for an exemption like this was not considered. It undermines the process and legit legitimacy of this committee's discussions if it's included at this late hour. <clears throat> Additionally, we are still concerned about the effects of a significant wage increase on the overall competitiveness to LA, and we ask that a simultaneous plan to aggressively reduce and reform the LA business tax be included at the same time. We again respectfully ask that the city address the total compensation issue facing our vital restaurant industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council President Weston, members of the committee. My name is Ruben Gonzalez. I'm here on behalf of the LA Area Chamber of Commerce. We would like to thank the Council President, the Chair, and the members of the committee for pushing forward a thoughtful process on issues like service charge, pay time off, and whether or not to have an exemption for labor. Obviously, we look forward to having deep discussions about that before any action is taken. We appreciate the thoughtful process. A lot of rhetoric has been thrown around the last eight months, a lot of fighting, a lot of a disagreement. Um, but what we have to remember is the business community agrees that we have a moral imperative to raise people out of poverty. We agree that we have a moral imperative to help the working poor. We simply disagree on the solution that's been put forth. Because today what we're thinking about and what people we've heard from are the business owners, small and medium, agonizing over how are they actually going to do this? How are they going to do this and keep their employees? How are they going to do this 
and keep open? How are they going to do this and not have to move out of the city? How are they going to do it? They're agonizing over it because these employees are their family members, because they care about them. Okay. Th thank you. And could, could summarize your comments. Just wrap up your comments. I had a little extra time on another speaker. Well, so then, I'm giving, you, you, special, up, I'm giving you some extra time, I'll too. I'll wrap it up if these folks will let me. Please, let's uh, have some order. Thank you. So as we move forward, remember, we all have the same goal. But the best commodity from a business perspective is a job because it empowers people to take care of their families and themselves. So let's make sure we're not losing that commodity. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your comment. OK, please, let's, uh, let's, let's respect everyone's right to, to their comments. John Howard. Stuart Waldman, John Walsh, Herman Herman, and Wayne from Encino. Good afternoon. I'm John Howland with the Central City Association. Throughout the committee and council hearing, wage increase advocates said that there should be no exemptions to a $15 an hour wage. Statements made by various council members said there should be no sub-minimum wages, anything below $15 in this policy. The city council categorically rejected all exemptions that would have helped businesses, restaurants, and nonprofits to adjust to this wage increase. Businesses that could not use total compensation when determining wages, unlike what the city does in its own living wage ordinance with its contractors. Even worse, groups like Chrysalis, Conservation Corps, and Homeboy Industries, and these people here, that provide transitional services to some of our most vulnerable uh, members, uh, people who are, were, uh, these people were not given an exemption. No loopholes means no loopholes. Or give consideration to everybody. And ask yourselves and your city attorney, how can California, 49 other states, and the federal government all set their own minimum wages without that somehow interfering with collective bargaining agreements? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Stuart Waldman, president of the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, VICA. I wish that I could say that in the past 10 days, not much has changed, but I can't. Unfortunately, because of the actions taken on increasing the minimum wage, business is already looking to move. One of our strategic partners, the Valley Economic Alliance, has had eight businesses call that represent 1,000 jobs collectively to look to move outside the city of Los Angeles. Unfortunately, this is going to happen. May not happen on a mass influx, but it's going to happen slowly. The one-year delay for small businesses doesn't actually help small businesses. It just delays the inevitable of a business having to try to become profitable to keep those jobs and create those jobs. We would ask for a longer delay for the small businesses. Thank you. Thank you. John Walsh at jwalshconfidential.wordpress.com. Let me tell you, I go back, my first job, 1960. Who was the President of the United States? Eisenhower. What was minimum wage? One dollar. What did one dollar buy then? It bought a huge amount. I could buy 20 packages of M&Ms. You know what the newspaper cost in the LA Times? Four cents. Now it's two dollars. You could live off a dollar. Then we, they, got, they decided they were going to raise the minimum wage in the early 60s to $1.25. And every goddamn small business in America said, we're going to go out of business. We can't afford $1.25. Every time you raise the minimum wage, small businesses or alleged small businesses say they're going to go out of business. They're going to flourish. We're still being paid, allowed for the cost of living, less than I got in 1960 under Eisenhower. And under this black president, poor people are doing less. <clears throat> All right. Yes. No exemptions. No exemptions. Make them all pay the same. Minimum wage, $15. Don't exempt anybody. Everybody suffers together. We gotta share the fucking pain. We gotta share the pain. 
We're all the same people. We live in the city, and we have no choice, right? So the, the Vika, the valley idiot that spoke here before me, says all his people are going to leave. Leave! Get out of here! Go to some other city. There's 78 other cities in L.A. County. I can name them all here. Can you give me five minutes? I'll name them all. No, you're not going to do that. Okay. Valencia, okay. So anyway, so no exemptions, no games, and also make the whole thing good. $15 January 1st, 2016. Let's get this shit going. All right. Okay, next up, uh, Adina Tesler, Bob Amino, Cecil Griffin, Dustin Baton, uh, and Alex Lopez. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Dustin Batten, and I'm with BizFed, the LA County uh, Business Federation, representing 88,000 employers in the city of Los Angeles. The recent effort by labor unions to pursue an exemption from the current minimum wage increase is outrageous. The very organizations that pushed so hard for this increase over the past seven months are now saying that they should be exempt. If the minimum wage increase is not good enough for labor unions, it is not good enough for anyone. Additionally, if the current ordinance is to be open to consider the sneaky grab at building labor memberships, then why not open it up to considering an increase in the number of employees for businesses who get an additional year to phase in, say from 25 to 100. Even 50 would be a step in a good direction. Finally, we see clarification on the language defining an employee. It currently states anyone who works at least two hours in the city of Los Angeles. Is that strictly for LA businesses, or does it also include businesses who send employees into the city for several hours a week? We need more clarity on this definition. Thank you. Members of the committee, my name is Cecil Griffin. I am a realtor that works throughout the uh, Los Angeles County. I am here to today to speak with regards to the proposed proposal to lien properties for unpaid city fines related to wage disputes. We believe that the businesses should operate fairly and openly and comply with laws and, wor and work to protect their, wor their wa workers. I believe that you will find the vast majority of these businesses operate this way. One of the challenges I see is that the city has not clarified what pro properties that are owned can be lean through this process. And what I mean specifically is how this ordinance needs to be better reflect corporate ownership aspects. Since the employment agreement is between the employee and the employing company, that is where the lien should take place. The ordinance should reflect the corporate structure and the limit. Th the limit thank you, sir. Structures. Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> Good afternoon, council members. My name is Adina Tesler, and I'm representing the California Restaurant Association. I want to thank you for this process, um, for all the work you've done to get us to where we are today. Um, I've circulated a letter from the Restaurant Association again with some solutions that we feel that still could be incorporated into the, into the minimum wage ordinance. Uh, the restaurant industry has been here talking with you about these solutions all along. And over the past few days, we've learned that a possible labor exclusion from the minimum wage ordinance would allow labor to actually negotiate a total compensation model with employers. It was amazing to us that this model actually could work for organized labor, but not for the restaurants. Looking at what at total benefits that an employee gets and being able to negotiate that into a contract is exactly the type of solution that we have been asking for all along. I ask you uh, to direct your attention to the letter we've circulated and consider some of these solutions as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. My name is Alex Lopez. I'm a program director for the LA Conservation Corps. I joined the LA Conservation Corps in 1991 uh, as a core member through the core, 
my life was transformed, allowing me to move into multiple leadership roles. Moving from a core member to a program director now in a Boyle Heights site. I can honestly say if this opportunity wasn't given to me, I wouldn't be standing here today. I'd be in prison or six feet under. Growing up in East LA with a long history of gang affiliation with my family, exposed to drugs, violence, uh, the challenges were substantial. While some young people have hopes and dreams of going to UCLA or USC as a young person, my hopes and dreams were to go to a California state prison like Corcoran or Pelican Bay. I share this as a voice for all our young people right now. The long lines that are surrounding our buildings right now with a constant knocks on the door for opportunity to get in and get job training. We're not a job and we support the minimum wage, but we're a training program. And I, I ask for your support with the transitional job program exemption program. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, uh, Esteban Mendez, uh, Hendon Morales, Crystal Mar Marquin, uh, Dulce Ruiz, Jasmine Angelis, and Ruth Sarnoff. Good afternoon, my name is Hernan Morales. I've been at the Corps for, I've been with the LA Conservation Corps for about four years. I never saw myself helping the community or even change uh, my friends or encourage other people to join the program. I know it's a job training program, but I consider this as a job. Without this program, I don't know where I've been. And I'm here today for your support to help us, to help everyone in the program. Being here changed my life in so many ways that every morning, every project that I had, I give it without my heart. Contributing to the community, to the environment, to the city, from planting trees all over LA and building community gardens for people that don't even have backyards. And just seeing it with a big smile really changed my heart. So I'm here today to ask you guys for your support and to help us, not just me, but everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Crystal Marroquin. I'm on behalf of the LA Conservation Corps. Um, I've been here for about three years now, and I'm just, um, I mean, I had a not-so-great childhood, and the core, I never thought I was actually going to make it. I have my high school diploma, I have my driver's license, I attended college, and never thought I was make it this far. I wouldn't have made it this far without the LA Conservation Corps. I dropped out when I was 15 due to personal problems. I had to take care of two children that weren't mine, and... Um, I mean, we're hoping to get exempt from this because without this opportunity, without, we wouldn't have so many people or so many young adults like me coming into the core and getting the experience I have. Without the core, I wouldn't have all the experience I have. Before this, I've never had a job before, so um, we're just hoping to get exempt from it so we could have more people like me to come get more job experience and make it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dulce Ruiz, and I'm 23 years old, and I'm a single mother of one child. By the age of 11 years old, I immigrated to the United States. I dropped out of high school when I was 16 years old. Um, when I was 16 years old, I dropped out of high school. In 2012, I received my DACA, which it gave me the opportunity to join the Los Angeles Conservation Corps. Now I gained my high school diploma and became a guardian specialist with all the hard work and skills they provide for me. Um, I'm still working harder so I can become a driver and then complete my dreams farther to, be, to become someone for me and my son. 
So if the corpse is not exempted, fewer young adults will get the opportunity I did at the LA, LA Conservation Corps. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, council meetings and also committees. Uh, my name is Jasmine Andres. I'm 24. I'm representing the Los Angeles Conservation Corps. I started a year ago. I've completed it. I've been a driver, and I'm in the technical construction. And I'm proud to say, as a 24-year-old year young lady, I now can operate heavy machines and conduct um, power, um, power tools as well. Um, without this opportunity with, for the Los Angeles Conservation Corps, a lot of young Corps members um, here today and none, I'm the voices of those that cannot, cannot be here today and for your support to give us this opportunity for um, to help young adults at risk whether it be financially family educational and other types of addictions that they need help with I'm here to ask for your help to um, help these young people and um, and getting job skills opportunities thank you thank you Good afternoon, Council Member. My name is Stephanie Mendez. I'm part of the Los Angeles Conservation Corps. Um, I'm a driver. They helped me a lot get through everything that I didn't have. Now I have a lot of skills that I never had in my life. I, I caught a case and I would have been in prison. They helped me. They helped me through everything. They helped me through my legal. They helped me close my case. They help me be a better parent. They help, they're like my whole family right there. It's everything, I just wish that you guys can give more opportunities to them. And I just. It's okay, take your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Sarnoff, uh, a little old lady from Pasadena. Um, I want to, um, I want to say that I hope that um, you will stretch your vision even beyond uh, this fifteen dollar uh, an hour minimum wage to see the importance of providing more clean buses and more bus routes in the city to. Uh, really work with the uh, idea of the of 12 days of sick or for sickness, uh, death, for vacations, however people and families need it. Uh, as a mother of five and grandmother of five and with two great grandchildren coming up, I can tell you the amount of emergencies that come and they come in the night and transportation for women, particularly at night from jobs and men, is just uh, really needs to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comment, uh, colleagues. Uh, before uh, I uh, invite you to uh, make any comments, let me just remind, um, remind the neighbors that, you know, this is an ongoing process. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, things to be resolved, uh, issues around transitional workers. We're going to be taking that up uh, uh, later in, um, in the month of June. The committee is going to take that up. The issue of sick pay, we're going to be taking that up for some further discussion, further um, uh, collaboration, review before any policy is um, uh, proposed on that. Um, but this is going to continue to be an open process. We solicit your ideas, your thoughts, uh, and your suggestions. Uh, having said that, uh, members, uh, are there any uh, comments or, or amendment, amendments that uh, yeah, yeah. I'd like to. there is any interest in pr producing at this time? <laughs> Mr. Wesson. Well, I'd like to have a few words, if I might, uh, and then there will be some recommendations. Uh, at the end, I, I want to seriously thank this committee for all of the hard work led by you, Mr. Chairman, on this very 
challenging issue that we're trying to address today. But I want to remind the people that are here today and I want to remind the members of this committee what drove us to try to do this. It was not because this council or this committee was carrying labor's water. It was not because members of this committee wanted to uh, jam the business community. The reason why you see action is because the members of this committee, Nuri Martinez, yourself, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bonin, and the mayor, both spoke out early about a citywide policy. And the reason why is because we wanted to do our part in taking almost one million Los Angelinos from poverty to an opportunity to have a middle class life. That is the spirit and the intent of everything that we have attempted to do for that reason. This process, you need to know, has been slightly over eight months, almost a nine month process where we've received, received input from all of our members, from the mayor's office. We expanded this committee to seven members so that more council people could actually be engaged. The, the chairman had the wisdom to hold a series of hearings throughout the city of Los Angeles so that we could get input from everyone. We had three different economists give us a report. We had a peer review. We had an independent, I think, report from some professors at, uh, at UCLA. So we have done our part in trying to collect every bit of data that we could before we decided to proceed. For us, this process is important. For us, we believe that this process should be respected. Now at the end of the day, not everybody is going to agree with the product, but I would hope that most people would appreciate the process that we have taken to get to this point. Every time an issue, Mr. Chairman, has come up that we felt we did not have enough time to talk about, we have taken that issue and put it on a separate track. Every time. And we're going to get to those issues. But what we're focusing on is passing the majority of this ordinance. So my request, of course, is that we support your committee's recommendation. But I do think that it is important that, uh, to piggyback on what I said earlier to the city attorney's office, I don't think that we, our goal was to adversely affect uh, legislation or motions that were already in effect where related to living wages and minimum wages increase. So the uh, city attorney should return to us with language if necessary to make sure that we don't do that. And also where the, the uh, uh, topic of the, the, this past week where individuals were talking about the uh, collective bargaining piece, uh, th there's been no proposal. There, it is not in the report. There has not been an official request from this body or this committee to insert it, but I do think it's important enough that we review it. So I would like to request that the uh, CLA, uh, in partnership with the uh, city attorney's office, come back to us with a report where it relates to, to this issue. There are a lot of uh, questions. We've got over 20, 30 municipalities in the state that have something like this in place. I want to understand, I want the people to understand, why is that? Are there legal concerns? What is it? So given the other items that we have on a separate track, mm -hmm. I'm requesting that we put that item on that track as well. And also, I want to make sure that the action that we, 
you know, and a report back. And I want to make sure that the action we take does not adversely affect uh, uh, other measures that we work so hard to put in place. So with that said, I want to thank the public, thank business, thank labor, but more importantly, the courage of the members of this committee and this council. I am very proud to be your president. Thank you. Vice Chair Krikorian. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I just... Please. Uh, I already told you, behave. I love you, but I came out, I told her, behave. See yeah. what happened? <laughs> well, I consider that behaving. <laughs> <laughs> She's saying nice things about you, Mr. President. That's behaving. Um, I, I just want to, first of all, uh, echo uh, the President's comments about the process that this committee has gone through and, and Mr. Chairman I especially want to thank you for your, your leadership in getting us through nine difficult months. It's, it's as long as childbirth. I mean it's, it's been a long ordeal to get to this point um, and we have really exhaustively uh, considered the input of every conceivable stakeholder uh, in the city's economy. Uh, we've considered economic analysis in great detail. We've had robust debate. Um, we've taken in the broadest degree of public comment imaginable on any issue, I think. And, and it shows. And the result has been a thoughtful, um, measured, um, uh, and yet bold, I think, step forward that's helping to lead the discussion nationally. I mean, many of you probably saw after the council's action, this, this was a, an issue of national attention because of the big step forward Los Angeles is taking. And uh, I, because of that process, the city attorney was given instructions to draft an ordinance with, you know, pretty precise uh, parameters. And the city attorney's office has done that and brought us an ordinance that I think reflects uh, very much the the instructions that were given to uh, to the city attorney's office by the council. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm I'm going to have a number of specific questions that I want to address to the city attorney for a report back. And um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to do that, but I, I will have some questions on on kind of drafting language issues details, but. That being said, um, I would like, if I, if I may, to uh, move approval of the ordinance in its present form and move that we advance this to council with all deliberate haste and that the council be allowed to act on this ordinance as soon as possible as it's written and as it's before us right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? Mr. Wezar. Yeah, I have a, a quick question on, yes. on one of the definitions in the ordinance. If I could ask the city attorney to come up. Uh, one of the um, speakers brought up the issue of, uh, and, and by the way, I, I support the, uh, the direction of our council president and our vice chair for this committee and their motions. Um, uh, but I did want to clarify before we move on that. Uh, the, one of the speakers brought up the issue of how we define an employee, which is anybody who works two, uh, within two hours a week in the city of Los Angeles. And... Um, that, that just raised the issue to me. Is that a standard definition, kind of like a term of art in labor law, or are we creating that? And secondly, it's kind of vague if, when I just read it. I mean, is somebody who has a business outside of Los Angeles, if they come in and work in Los Angeles for two hours, does that qualify them for this? Do we have any jurisdiction over them? Um, so I just wanted to raise that be, uh, before we move on. Um, Valerie Flores, Senior Assistant City Attorney again. Um, the definition is very standard among other California cities that have adopted a minimum wage ordinance, um, as we mentioned in our report. Um, uh, this two-hour threshold um, is the same threshold used by other California cities. And yes, it would mean that someone who um, works part-time in the city of Los Angeles will be entitled to the city's higher minimum wage for those hours worked in the city. Um, and did you have any other questions? Yes, yeah, but it's for those hours worked in this city. Correct. Okay. Be so. Under our police powers, we can only uh, pass laws that, in, you know, uh, involve matters that occur within our jurisdictional mm -hmm. boundaries. So if someone works 
10 hours a week in Los Angeles, we can govern what rate is paid for those hours, but not hours worked outside the jurisdiction under our police powers. I get that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, if I could follow up on that point. Yes, if Mr. I could just follow up on that one point, because th this is an area that I was um, a little struggling with as well. Um, the, the employer definition is not limited to Los Angeles businesses. Correct. Um, the employee definition is defined with this two-hour uh, thing. So a, a business located in Glendale that has a delivery service that delivers to Ventura County has a driver that has to drive every day through the San Fernando Valley, probably spends a half an hour each way on that route. So there's no business activity being done in Los Angeles other than passing through. That employee is working more than two hours a week in the city of Los Angeles. And so I don't expect you to, I'm not going to throw out hypotheticals and then have you, you know, try to respond, well, would that count? Would that count? But, but as you report this back, um, I would like to kind of explore at some length these kinds of examples because my concern with this is in that example, uh, by the way, the, the ordinance itself doesn't, the language of the ordinance doesn't limit the increased pay to only the time spent in Los Angeles. It's, it's a blanket statement. So I assume that our limitation is based on common law limitations of our police power. Yeah, as a matter of law, okay. only hours worked in the city of Los Angeles will qualify for the Los Angeles living wage. Okay, so then the issue, I guess, becomes we've got a business that doesn't do business in Los Angeles. We've got, uh, you know, employee that passes through. Um, they don't presumably pay business tax in the city of Los Angeles. Um, it seems to me that a, there's going to be significant challenges with enforcement of that. Uh, B, there's going to be um, a, an increased potential for a preemption argument that because of this kind of an ordinance, the entire statewide wage structure becomes too challenging for businesses to comply with if every city that the driver goes through on the way to deliver goods is paying a different hourly rate. So I would like you to report back when you do on the risk that this entire ordinance might fall apart and become preempted because of circumstances like that, as well as the application of, and I, I definitely don't want you to comment on that now because, you know, that's a, that's probably an attorney-client communication that I don't really want to have. have but uh, we're, we're confident that the ordinance is not preempted by state law, even with the current definition, which again is, is the similar to the definitions used in other cities, but we are happy to report back. Yeah, for example, um, and, I don't know that any, have any of those been challenged on that ground, those other cities? On that basis, yes. and, I'm not aware yeah. of Okay, so if so, then I kind of need to be convinced about that a little bit. So um, that's one thing. And then uh, on the definition of employer, um, the, the um, I'm, I'm not sure what the basis for the definition is, um, but it in incorporates a very wide um, number of people other than the person who's responsible for the payment of the salary. Yeah. Uh, it includes yes. subordinate corporate executives and um, officers and people who don't employ an employee but exercise control or somebody who does employ but doesn't exercise control. I'm a little concerned that that net makes it, again, the enforcement issue almost unmanageable. And I'm not sure, I, I just don't know what that's going to incorporate when you look at a, when we go beyond actual corporate personhood and individual personhood, yeah. huh. you know, and, and actually yeah. define employers in a way that isn't associated with a legal entity. I, I, it just seems to me that that becomes a little bit unmanageable. Um, yeah, here again, we look to other cities and um, and all the other cities in California that have their own minimum wage uh, cleave to state law and the definition in state law for what is and is not an employer. So that's what our definition does as well. It adopts the state definition of employer. So it's a very well-defined, very well-litigated, um, uh, very well-enforced 
uh, definition. And okay. um, I think that will give us a lot of guidance as we go forward. Um, the state has a long history of um, understanding the employer-employee relationship. And over the years, this definition has uh, changed the state definition to accommodate uh, different types of employer-employee relationships. And one of the goals in the ordinance, of course, is to be as clear as possible. And so we think that um, following the state lead, again, in their years of experience in understanding what, what constitutes an employer was the best way to protect the city's ordinance. Is that section 1197? Because that's mentioned in sub C sub 2. I yeah, it's um, in the minimum wage ordinance. Um, if you look at 187.01D, um, we refer to section 18 of the California Labor Code. Yeah, but that just defines person. Yes. That doesn't define employer. So yes. I'm wondering if there's a definition somewhere in the state labor code of employer that this tracks. Yes. Okay, if you could just get that for me too, because it is in section 18. That's the definition of person. So, okay. Um, there's probably other yeah, things, but well, let me and also through. section. If you look to the um, section C, um, you know there an employer is defined in section 1197 okay. of the okay, labor that, code yeah, as well. That's what I and there okay. are also a series of um, California Industrial Welfare Commission refinements on the definition, which this ordinance uh, incorporates by reference. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Koretz? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I don't want to dig too deep into the weeds on this, but I, I also have a question that this line of conversation concerns me a little bit, so I want to be sure that once we do this, we really have it nailed down. So, example is a, a job I used to have. I used to sell health insurance for a company in the LA area. So, if they were located in the city of Los Angeles, but you sold to a client here and there that was in Santa Monica and one that was in Culver City and sometimes in Los Angeles. Are we saying that we think if, let's say roughly 20% of the time you were outside the city of Los Angeles, that your employer would only have to pay you the minimum wage the 80% of the time that you were working in the city of Los Angeles? Because I had assumed that would be 100% and they wouldn't be trying to look at every client you went to and figuring out when you were in and out of the city. That doesn't seem very practical. And then the question is the reverse. If they were based in Culver City and they spent half their time dealing with clients in LA and half out, you know, how does that all work? I don't know that you have to answer that question now, but I think we should have the, all that answered when this comes back to us. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Dave Michelson with the city attorney's office. City Council will be using the city's police powers to enact this law, and in using its police powers, it's focused, the City Council, the City of Los Angeles, is focused on affording protections for the worker. So the focus is on where that worker is working. And when they're working within the boundaries of the City of Los Angeles, that's when they're entitled to this new city general uh, citywide minimum wage. So there will be some accounting that will be necessary for the employer to do, and it's not so much where the employer as their office situated. It's really where the work is taking place for that, uh, of that employee. So they, they would actually have to track when their customers are in, in the city and when their customers are out of the city. And so they would be potentially paid $10 an hour for some of their time and $15 an hour for some of their time also. That's correct. correct. Okay. Any other questions, members? Well, I just want to clarify one thing that we started off the conversation on, and there may be a number of report backs. I want to clarify uh, the issue of reconciling the hotel wage ordinance with uh, this one, and then we're going to have a report back from the city attorney's office as to what those conflicts may be and any action the council may want to take beforehand, and if you could advise us if we should take those before or just, you know, uh, not much of a legal issue as we move forward, but we're going to get a report back on that as well. If that's that great. could be part of your your motion, that's correct? Yeah. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, just just to kind of ease the burden a little bit for the city attorney's office, because I think some of this is mixing policy and, and law and stuff. If if we could suggest that perhaps the report back should come from the CAO, the CLA, in consultation with the city attorney, that way they 
don't have to make the judgment calls about policy uh, and can advise us on the law, and we get CAO and CLA input as well. Mr. Cedillo? I'm uh, waiting for uh, matters related to the uh, Enforcement? Uh, wage theft ordinance. Let's Correct. Let's come in next. Yep. Okay, members, any, uh, any further discussion? Um, we're going to uh, recommend that we approve the ordinance and request for the report backs made by uh, council members uh, Weston, Krikorian. Am I leaving anything out? Yeah, Mr. Clerk, would you uh, recap those report backs that uh, have been requested of council in conjunction with approval of the ordinance that uh, we were about to uh, do? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, the the report backs are have been now uh, reclassified as the CAO and the CLA to report back in consult in consultation with the city attorney on uh, language to ensure that the minimum wage does not conflict with other wage measures, that the um, uh, report back on the labor exemption for collective bargaining issue, to um, report back on circumstances where an employee would be, for example, passing through the city and how examples like that would work and whether there are any circumstances or preemptions by state law. And uh, those are the uh, the uh, amendments. Make not, not amendments, but these report uh, requests. I'm sorry, the backs. report backs right. we're, we're, as requested by uh, the committee. Okay, and this is just one thing I want to be I want to be clear on is where uh, it's a request of the city attorney's office to draft the necessary uh, language that would ensure that in passing this law that it does not conflict with the existing wage issues that are already on the book and if I need to get with Mr. Cedillo and work that out we need to um, Mr. Does the report back? Well just if I may Mr. Chairman I what I heard Mr. Weezer to be asking for, too, is a policy report back yeah. on where those conflicts may be, not merely advice on how to ensure that this statute doesn't conflict with the previous one, but also where are the areas of conflict so that if there are potential policy decisions to be made, those would be before the council. Is that, did I hear that correctly, Mr. Weezer? But I can still get the a review from the city attorney where it relates to language when we vote on this I want that to be clear if we change it later based on a report back that's that's one thing council, mem council members David Michelson with the city attorney's office uh, on July 1st of 2015 and a little more than 30 days the citywide hotel minimum wage ordinance um, kicks in, so to speak, with respect to hotels with, I believe it's more than 300 rooms. Um, one of the concerns might be, if you're a hotel employer, is whether they still have to comply with that law come July 1 of this year, or whether they don't have to comply because the city has presumably by then enacted a city general, uh, citywide general uh, minimum wage. Um, as my colleague Valerie Flores mentioned earlier in this hearing, we believe there's well-established law that will still give full force and effect to our other city wage laws, including the citywide hotel minimum wage law. However, if you want to ensure there's no doubt about that, um, you could, if you were so inclined, request the city attorney's office to uh, have full city council um, request the city attorney's office to return with uh, two ordinances, for instance. One, uh, amending the citywide hotel minimum wage to make clear it is not superseded by the new city general, citywide general 
minimum wage. And ditto with respect to, for instance, the city living wage ordinance. That is your prerogative if you want to do that. That's up to you. I just want to make sure that there is definitely not a conflict. I want to make sure that what we do next Wednesday doesn't undo work that was already done. If you're telling me that we, that I wanted you to make sure that we're going about it the best way. And if we needed to alter language, I wanted that language to be back before the full council. So uh, that that's the request that, I, that, that I'm making. And I don't know if you have to do it in different ordinances or one ordinance 1A, 1B. That's not what I wanted. I just want to make sure I don't think it's the intent of this committee to undo the work that's already been done. So then one possibility would be if this committee today were to recommend to the full city council next week that at that meeting of full city council next week, the full city council were to request the city attorney's office to um, transmit ordinances uh, effectuating exactly what you just said, in other words, amending those ordinances, hotel citywide, living wage ordinance, to make clear they are not superseded by this um, citywide general minimum wage, we would return with that. So if that's a full city council request of our office next week, we of course would do that. That remains to be seen if that will be the request. I guess to play it safe, maybe you should give us a version like that. I don't know what the, the, the feeling of the members are, but just let's have that uh, available if need be. Mr. Weezar, you and I should talk to make sure that, to talk that we're it. on the same page. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, our city attorney uh, stated my concern correctly in that we may be creating a situation where there are answers. Um, we don't want to leave such ambiguity as to what we should, what so either the hotels or citywide, what should they be following. And then we could only resolve that in the courts. We'd rather do that up front and be clear about what we're doing and not wait to be sued. And then, oh, this is the answer. We, we should do that up front and be very clear about what direction we're going so that we don't leave this ambiguity out there. And, and I think it will behoove us to have those answers up front rather than wait till later. So that, that, we could go with your direction, Mr. President. And All right. So Mr. I, I just want to make sure we capture all of this on, on this issue. So there will be a report back from the CAO, the CLA, in consultation with uh, the city attorney um, about areas of potential conflict between this ordinance and other existing ordinances with potential ways to um, uh, uh, remove those conflicts one way or the other. But in addition to that, uh, the president is asking for uh, an ordinance that would be put before the council to ensure that the hotel minimum wage ordinance that's about to go into effect would not be superseded. But if I understood from what you said, Mr. Michelson, and I just right. to make sure we have our process right, are, were you saying that the that this committee needs to recommend that the council instruct you to bring an ordinance back like that, or can we? do that in, in our committee? Well, well, ultimately, our office will look to the full city council for that direction. Um, this committee can recommend that full city council take that course next week. And um, if that indeed occurs and full city council um, uh, makes that request of our office, we will return with those ordinances quickly. Okay. So that ordinance would not be before us next week until the council votes to instruct you to do that? That's correct, council. Okay. Now, yeah, yeah. So, and then if I may just... Um, on the questions that I had about the transient uh, employment and, and so forth, the definition of employer and employee, um, I asked some legal-ish questions to the city attorney, um, but since we're getting a report back from the CAO and the CLA, um, I'd like also to include in that report back um, options for uh, definitions of both employer and employee that um, uh, other cities have adopted. Um, that are present in, in other similar ordinances uh, that would um, both uh, fulfill the best interests of employees in Los Angeles and businesses in Los Angeles. As Mr. Kretz was pointing out, I, I hadn't thought until just today that w the way we've done it could mean that you have a full-time employer in Los Angeles, based in Los Angeles, um, who would essentially evade the impact of this if their employee is working 
you know, some portion of their time outside of the city of Los Angeles. That, I, I think that's an important point. We should have options before us, policy options, to ensure that we um, make the right choice on that. So that, that's more a policy question than a legal question. So I'd ask the CLA to incorporate those uh, recommendations as well. Okay, okay members, any other uh, questions, comments then? Uh, without objection, we're going to approve the ordinance as presented and request report backs uh, made by Council Members Kikorian, Koretz, Wesson, and Wezar. Uh, without objection, that will be the order. Okay, Mr. Clerk, items two and items three we will take up together. Madam Clerk. Item number two, City Attorney Report and Ordinance relative to adding a new Article 8 to Chapter 18 of the Municipal Code, creating a Wage Enforcement Division. Establishing penalties for wage violations and amending sections of the municipal code. <clears throat> okay, let's ask our city attorneys back to the table. This is on two and three items, two and three. Valerie Flores, senior assistant city attorney. Um, one of the uh, Two ordinances we transmitted, uh, again, does create a wage enforcement division that will be housed in the Bureau of Contract Administration and uh, will be able to uh, investigate and um, issue notices and have appeals regarding uh, claims of wage theft. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the ordinance. Well, I think we want to make sure that uh, we have a way of... Uh enforcing uh, the, the wages that we're fighting hard to make sure that uh, individuals are going to receive. Uh, this has been a real big issue uh, throughout the city that's been raised, especially by African-American um, workers who claim that to file, uh, my understanding, twice as many complaints with the EEOC every year. Uh, and, and so and I think we all have experiences, family, friends, where uh, individuals have been discriminated against uh, to their detriment. Um, and that's why we were looking closely at these anti-discrimination provisions, especially as we uh, discuss enforcement issues. Uh, let me ask you a question. What laws currently exist regarding anti-discrimination that protect um, workers uh, and citizens in the city? Um, federal and state laws currently exist um, to prevent discrimination by employers. And um, many of those laws would actually preempt the city from uh, enacting further laws on that subject. Uh, it's a very um, uh, well-developed body of, of uh, state law. But we would be happy to, um, if you have specific uh, provisions you'd like us to add, to research those and report back. Uh, we could work with the CLA and the CAO uh, to determine uh, you know, areas where we can legislate um, per, I think it's been suggested that perhaps in the civil rights area we may have some um, areas where we can legislate without being preempted. And we're happy to work with the CLA's office and the CAO's office to explore those areas and report back. Uh, would the city be able to enforce an anti-discrimination policy or, or would, we, would we be preempted from doing that? Yeah, with regard to um, anti-discrimination in employment, we believe we are very largely preempted by state law. But again, we're happy, to, if you have specific uh, proposals you'd like to have us look at, we're more than happy to look at those and report back. Could the city establish a formal referral process or a partnership uh, with uh, other agencies, public agencies? Uh, that, for that, might be, right. that might be one area where we wouldn't be preempted to work cooperatively with uh, other government entities or even nonprofits. Um, to um, have some sort of a referral process. So we'd be happy to look into that further. I think we, we definitely should take a look and see how we could collaborate with other jurisdictions and, and what the partnerships could be. Uh, members, any, any questions? Mr. Cedillo. Yes, no, I, I thank you for that. Uh, and, and just to continue along that, although we're not, although this is a matter of law, right? Discrimination is, is a matter of law or anti discrimination laws exist. Um, we're not precluded, though, from articulating that within our ordinance. Is that correct? We, we could uh, 
reiterate the city's uh, commitment to ensure there's no discrimination in employment. Right, Correct. and then we could also look at, at uh, wage theft within the context of that. So we could also evaluate that an act of wage theft might also be uh, part of an act of discrimination. Again, we, we could, we're definitely uh, happy to look at that and see whether that's something where we're not preempted. And if so, we, you know, could come back with some, you know, suggestions about what we could do. But, but because this area is, 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 uh, heavily uh, uh, legislated under state law, we, we're going to have to research any specific proposals and get back to you. Okay. Well, I, mean, I think we all share an interest in trying to elevate the question of, of discrimination uh, as part of our efforts to protect the wages and conditions, circumstances of workers in the city. And so we want to elevate it and have a report back that talks about what is our capacity to do that, what is the greatest capacity that we have to elevate it to that level of wage theft. Uh, second, if I may. Uh, I would like to, uh, for us, and we've been having this conversation as a sidebar, but with respect to, on a separate matter, the proprietaries, the LAX, DWP, uh, the LA port, I would like us to figure out how we can have this, uh, our wage theft ordinance apply to them how we move to encourage or to the extent we can compel, encourage, facilitate uh, their governing bodies to embrace the, um, the wage theft ordinance uh, and also to figure out how we can uh, collaborate with our proprietaries to, to have that, basically a collaboration between the two. So we take advantage of one of their, their scale, their resources, uh, their specific knowledge in, in this area and embrace those entities as part of a broader enforcement scheme uh, that this um, that this city uh, endeavors to to uh, move forward with okay. we'd be pleased to work with the CLA and the CAO we'd be pleased to bring that report back thank you so much thank you mr. Koretz. Um uh, on the discrimination uh, issue, uh, I know one of the things my office is looking at is the possibility that wage theft can be linked to uh, a corresponding civil rights violation, and that might allow the city to triple the cap on administrative fines and violations for those that specifically <laughs> include discrimination. So if that could be part of the report back to see if we can do that. Um, also, uh, as, as I think everyone knows, I've been working on this issue for a long time, both at the state and city level. One of the biggest problems is that when uh, an employee has gone through the whole process at great risk to themselves, the rate of collection is only a little over 16 percent. So we need to find a way to nail down the fact that those collections will happen. Um, probably the best solution I've heard is the ability to require employers to post bond um, and at what point they would have to do that, um, whether it's uh, before hearing an appeal, whether it's at an earlier point. So if you could report back on that, that ultimately would be an almost foolproof solution uh, because then uh, when the employer loses the case, if they do lose it, then we have the money already. Um, and in, in fairness to the employer, we could hold the bond, get interest on it if there's some interest that they're owed. If they ultimately prevail, then we give them back the interest and give them back the money. But in, in a huge number of cases, they don't prevail, they owe the money, it's recognized that they owe the money, and then how does a little employee collect it is very difficult. So uh, uh, I think that might be the most important piece of it if we can do that. Um, also, uh, whether we can, uh, as a, a less good but possible uh, solution, um, whether we can implement liens. And uh, I've worked with your office and I have some language, but I think the big question is whether we legally can do that or not. So if we could have a report back on that. Um, and then there is a question of whether the ordinance as it's written 
allows us to uh, uh, file this as a misdemeanor. And I think we should, should look at whether we can, whether we need to call that out more clearly, which I, I have, again, have language to do, but I think we, we need to look at whether, whether, we, whether we already can through the way the ordinance is written and whether we actually should identify a time to do that. So maybe it's the second time an employer is found guilty of, of wage theft following the implementation of the ordinance. Um, the first time we find them and, and take all those steps, um, if they do it again, then we can take all those same steps but also include a criminal prosecution. So I'd like to ask if we can look at all those things with a report back. Um, I think this is an important issue. As we all know, we're the wage theft capital of the United States uh, with, with tens of millions every single week. The, the key is once we identify it, once we go to the process, how do we make sure those employees actually pay those workers so they actually get the money? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Kretz, uh, for your leadership on the issue at the state level and, and back here at home. Members, any other comments? Councilwoman Martinez. I have a, a request to make. Can we also include a discussion in your report back that we also discuss how if businesses have been convicted in the past of wage theft, how do we prevent from doing business with, business with those businesses in the future as a city? Um, we should not be rewarding bad behavior, and we shouldn't be spending tax, dollar, tax dollars rewarding bad behavior. So I want to make sure that we have that conversation about how we prevent and, you know, giving business, our city business, to businesses that have been convicted of wage theft in the past. Well done. Mr. Koretz and Mr. Kikoria. Just to follow up to that, maybe we could also include how we deal with city contractors if we find they're engaging in wage theft and how we uh, can leverage them to, uh, to halt those practices uh, or lose their contract. Okay. Mr. Koretz, Mr. Kikoria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, these are uh, great ideas for us to be exploring in further discussion. I would just point out that most of that is not within the city attorney's province. It's mostly within the CLA's uh, jurisdiction to advise us on policy choices that we can be making there. Um, but certainly that should be in concert with the city attorney to ensure that whatever policy decisions we're making, we can in fact legally make. So um, I would just ask that the CLA uh, and I suppose the CAO as well should be involved in that because they're probably this probably would call for a significant expansion in the budget of the, uh, the enforcement arm as well. Some of these, or, or it might even provide a benefit if there's increased fines. Then, but anyway, that's something that the CAO should look at. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's go to public comment. Thank you, uh, to the attorneys. Appreciate your counsel and advice. Jacqueline Mija, Martha Munoz. Ruben Gonzalez, John Howland, and Matt Soroli. Please come forward. Public comment, please. Good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Mejia. I'm here on behalf of the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles as their policy advocate. Chirla is a leading immigrant, immigrant rights group in Los Angeles. Currently the, Los, uh, currently, the city of Los Angeles is very lenient on businesses and unscrupulous employers. If someone steals my wallet, they go to jail. If a business steals my wage, there isn't a sufficient process that allows for justice and collection. Wage theft is a crime, but is not punished as a crime. We believe that including lean language will help to t uh, deter unscrupulous employers from committing this horrific crime that keeps our hardworking Angelinos in poverty. The least that can be done is include lean language, a bond, and a collection mechanism to ensure our workers get their hard-earned loss wages back. This is why we need a well-funded bureau with, with enforcement um, of the minimum wage and wage theft. How can we ensure justice for our communities if we are not properly funding our enforcement mechanism? We must make sure that we are not setting up this system to fail. Thank you. Thank you for your comments.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Ruben Gonzalez with the LA Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, wage theft is bad for business. It's bad for the, the good corporate citizens who are doing their job and paying their workers as they should. So we, of course, support enforcement of wage rules. However, I'd ask you to take a step back and look at what's proposed as a business owner who's doing what they're supposed to do and gets a specious complaint. This system that is laid out in what's written currently is rife for abuse. Much like you have the lawyers who are quote unquote ADA trolls, you will have wage trolls that use specious complaints to leverage. The appeals process is so limited and it's like trying to thread a needle in the time period and in the setup. The amount of power given to the hearing officers is immense and the, and the way of getting past it is it costly. And for small business owners, they don't have the money to go to court and fight for months and spend the money on attorneys. So please, we ask that you take the time, because we have time until the wage law goes into effect next July, to have a working group with business and workers' rights folks to actually set up a system that won't have abuses on either side. Thank you. Thank you. John Howland, Central City Association. Uh, I'd like to echo Ruben's remarks. Uh, CCA uh, believes that wage theft is a crime. It should be dealt with uh, accordingly. However, there is the ability for a lot of good actors to be punished in trying to take care of the bad actors. Please create a working group so that the good are not thrown in with the bad. Thank you. Sí, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Marta Muñoz y voy a requerir un intérprete. Momento. Primero que nada quiero agradecerles de que hayamos avanzado un paso en el en la aceptación de el salario aumentado a 15 dólares. I want to first thank you for taking the great steps towards adopting the ordinance to increase the wage to 15 dollars. Aún sigo pensando que aunque este paso es bueno, ese aumento se necesita ahora. Even though I, I still think that this is a very good step, the step is to be taken now, taking place now. También soy dueña de un pequeño negocio y por más de 30 años viviendo aquí en California, en el área de Los Ángeles, he sobrevivido. I'm also in a small business owner and I've been living in, here in Los Angeles for over 30 years and I have been able to survive. Les digo a las demás personas que tienen pequeños negocios que no tengan miedo, tienen más dinero que yo y seguro que van a sobrevivir. And what I would like to say to other small business owners is not to be afraid. I'm sure they have more money than I do, and they will also survive. Sé que están muy preocupados y piensan que, que van a perder esas pequeñas compañías y se van a ir de, amenazan irse de Los Ángeles. Y yo solo les digo, donde quiera que vayan, la justicia los va a alcanzar porque nosotros merecemos un mejor salario. And I know they keep threatening that they're going to leave, uh, go outside of the city, but wherever they go and whatever they do, if it's outside of L.A., the justice will still prevail and follow them. En otro punto también quiero mencionarles que ellos dicen que se preocupan por los trabajadores, cosa que es risible porque no veo en qué forma se preocupan si quieren, segui quieren seguirlos teniendo dentro de la miseria. Also, they keep saying that they're concerned about the workers, but I don't know how exactly they're being concerned of the workers if they want to continue keeping them in poverty levels. No, pero es que si estoy traduciendo es medio tiempo. Quisiera saber si puedo utilizar el de más tiempo ya que me están traduciendo y estoy usando solo la mitad. If you're going to give me more time because I'm using an interpreter and I'm only using half a time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bueno, please, please, please wrap up your comments. We we'll stop sí. the clock for you. Just wrap sí. your comments up. Uh, y por último quiero decir que eh, el 99% de la comunidad que es quien crea la riqueza tiene derecho a vivir con un salario digno, no a sobrevivir. And also, I want to say that 99% of all the residents who are living off of this uh, salary, they have a right to live, not to survive. 
Muchas gracias a todos y 14, 15 dólares aumento es requerido ahora. Gracias. Thank you. We, requ we are requesting 15 dollars an hour now. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Okay, Adina Tressler, Robin Wilson, Fanny Fuentes, uh, Victor Naro, and Maria Vasquez. Please come forward. Good afternoon again, council members. I'm here on behalf of the California Restaurant Association. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, the Restaurant Association has been supportive of uh, the wage theft ordinance and of uh, making sure that there is strict enforcement of wage theft. In fact, on the state level, the restaurant community has been working with um, Senate President De Leon on the Senate Bill um, 588, which is looking to um, increase enforcement and penalties as well. So I just wanted to, again, offer uh, the restaurant industry's help in your pursuit of um, creating the new, the new Labor Standards Board um, and enforcement, and also if there is a working group or opportunity for us to help with data collection, um, please call on us to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Fanny Fuentes. I'm an airport worker, and I would like to express uh, our happiness. We are in support of $15 an hour, but we also would like to um, focus on enforcement. Without enforcement, LAX is pretty much dead. We are facing wage theft at the airport. We just had one company that was um, fined $1,000. We're supposed to be um, in a world-class airport, and we're being treated as a second-class airport. So we're asking for you guys' support and for you guys to um, take in consideration. Uh, we would like to get a report on what's the next steps or um, any kind of report on regarding what is uh, next to be done about it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Robin Wilson, and just to clarify what Fanny said, the company was not fined $1,000. They were fined $1 million for stealing wages from their employees. Um, we are very happy that the council did, raise the, did agree to raise the wage to $15. We thank you. We support you in that. Um, however, we don't want to be excluded. LAX, DWP, or the port from the wage theft portion of this. We don't want our employers to get the green light to continue to steal from us, as, we just, as I just stated, from this company from LAX. We don't want our people to have a pass. We want them to be held to the same high standards that the rest of the city of Los Angeles is being held to. It's unfair for these employers to get a pass, but the rest of the city to be held to a different standard. Please do not exclude us. Please do not give our employers the right to continue to steal from us. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Victor Naro with the UCLA Labor Center. We greatly support the movement forward for waste theft enforcement. Uh, I want to talk for a minute about partnerships. The crisis of compliance in low-wage industries will not be solved through enforcement initiatives undertaken by the city alone. Fighting waste theft in Los Angeles will require collective effort. Community partnerships must be a major component of this process. There are many worker centers, community groups, legal service organizations and others that can enhance enforcement in many ways. A lot of these groups know the issue of waste theft. They're the experts. They've been dealing with it every day with, with the low-wage workforce here in Los Angeles. They can be effective partnerships, and they can be uh, effective collaborative partners in addressing waste theft. So I really would like to see us all move forward to figure out a, a strategy of providing resources for these kind of partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es María Vázquez. Soy mamá de seis hijos. Estuve trabajando 13 años en un restaurante. En ese lugar se hacía de todo, limpiar, cocinar, lavar trastes y muchas cosas más. 
Good afternoon, my name is Maria Vasquez and I'm a mother and um, I was working in a restaurant for 13 years. In this place where I was working, I did everything, cleaning, cooking, dishwashing and much more. No teníamos descanso ni horario para comer. Se trabajaban entre 12 y 14 horas diarias. Nunca nos pagaban tiempo extra y los patrones se quedaban con las propinas. We didn't have rest breaks and we didn't have time to eat. Um, the work hours were between 12 to 14 hours a day and we were never paid overtime and the owner also kept our tips. Otras compañeras y yo hicimos un reclamo de pago. Todos ganamos. El mío eran aproximadamente 80 mil dólares. Pero de eso no tenemos nada. Es por eso que estamos aquí, para que se nos ayude a que se haga una ley para colectar ese dinero. My coworkers and I, we did a wage claim and we all won. My wage claim was approximately $80,000, but I haven't seen any of this money. And that's why I'm here today, um, for, to please get help and also that there will be a law to collect this money. Y que el gobierno pueda trabajar junto con los grupos de apoyo que existen, con mucha gente como yo que nos da miedo hablar o no tenemos la suficiente información y con el grupo nos sentimos apoyadas. Gracias por su tiempo. And we're also here to ask um, that the city government can work together with community groups, support groups that exist, because many people such as myself are scared to speak up or we don't have sufficient information. And with support groups, we feel more supported. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Car Carolyn uh, Barlage. Jose Carta, Patricia Allen, Trina Taylor, Chaz Grayson, and Loretta Stevens, please. Good afternoon, and it's Barlage. Barlage, thank you. I'm a Pico Rivera Walmart worker of nine years. Wage theft is a crime. Most of the time when we think about wage theft, we think it's small, only small shady businesses that are engaging in the practice. The truth is, it happens everywhere. I've worked at the biggest corporation in the world for the last nine years. I saw firsthand for myself, dealing with it, how I was being pressured to not take my breaks, to work through my lunch, and even work off the clock at times. It was no surprise to me that a few years ago, Walmart had to pay workers $187.6 million in unpaid wages. We need to raise the minimum wage in a way that guarantees wages to all workers. Urge council to pass a $15 minimum wage with a Bureau of Enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. Mi nombre es Jose Arata. Trabajo para una compañía en el aeropuerto de Los Ángeles. Desde que empecé con la compañía hasta el 2012, trabajaba aproximadamente más de 8 horas al día, más de 40 horas a la semana. No me pagaban mis horas. Okay, you want to take a minute? Yes. Well, we broke it up, so... Oh, okay, excuse me. No me pagaban mis horas extras. Además, no tomaba mis tiempos de descanso debido a que el exceso de trabajo en muchas ocasiones tampoco lograba tomar mi tiempo de comida, debido a que el supervisor me enviaba a realizar otros trabajos que la compañía necesitaba, quisiera. Mis talones de cheque no reflejaban la información requerida. Hello, my name is Jose Arata, and I work for a company at LAX. Since I began with the company in 2012, I worked approximately eight hours a day, more than 40 hours a week, and I was not paid overtime. Also, I was not provided meal breaks due to excessive work at times, and I would not get meal breaks because the supervisor would send me do, to do things that the company needed. Also, my paycheck stubs never reflected the information it was required to. Estoy aquí porque sé que en el aeropuerto hay muchos problemas y muchas veces por miedo de represalia la gente decide callarse. Pero esto no quita la realidad que el robo de salario es muy común en el aeropuerto. I'm here because there is a lot of problems at LAX and often workers fear retaliation so we, and so we choose to be silent. But if this does not stop, the reality of wage theft will continue at LAX. Estoy aquí pidiéndole que sea más agresivo en proteger a nosotros los trabajadores del aeropuerto. 
I am here asking you to create an aggress aggressive enforcement to this ordinance. Workers at LAX need your protection. Hago un llamado a que hagan algo por la clase trabajadora, porque de nosotros dependen nuestras familias. Además, somos nosotros los que con muchos trabajos ayudamos que todo se mueva en el aeropuerto, donde entra cada día millones okay. de dólares yeah. gracias yeah. a nuestro trabajo. Yeah. I am pleading that you do something for working people and our families. With our hard labor, we help make LAX what it is and contribute to the billions of dollars that are generated daily. Thank you. Thank you. Good, after good afternoon, council members. My name is Trina Trailer, and I am a member of the LA Black Workers Center. And I am here in support to comprehensive wage enforcement with civil rights protection. I am currently a student at UCLA. I'll be graduating in two weeks. I am a parent of a 26-year-old daughter who I raised alone working two low-wage jobs. And I am, a, I am concerned about being able to find a job when I graduate, a good paying job when I graduate. Despite being a good student and serving my community as a member of the Los Angeles Black Workers Center, I have several barriers to finding employment. I am black, I am a woman, and I have a record for mistakes I made over 20 years ago. When I look, at, when I look around my campus, when I look at construction sites, and when I look at good paying jobs, it's like we are invisible. We need the city of Los Angeles to help protect us from discrimination. We need a local agency to stop bad employers from excluding us from working. I urge you to be courageous and establish an office of labor standards that will invest and enforce the anti-discrimination laws and enforce the minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Chaz Grayson. I'm 23 years old and a member of the Los Angeles Black Workers Center. I first want to thank the City of Los Angeles and the committee for the support of the wage increase of $15 an hour in wage theft enforcement, but I also urge the city to enforce my civil rights <clears throat> at the local level by making anti-discrimination real for all workers. I've been working since the age of 15, mostly part-time minimum wage jobs, and uh, as a non-union worker, <clears throat> construction worker, I have experienced wage theft, and my boss would tell me repeatedly over t my overtime wages will be on my next check, but I haven't gotten paid yet. I know people who's owed thousands, I'm owed thousands and hundreds in uh, unpaid overtime, and I also noticed that whenever I ask for overtime hours, they would tell me that it's no work, but there is work, it's just not for the black workers. And I don't blame the workers, I blame the people that's making the decisions. It shouldn't be this way, despite the fact that the black workers are only 2% of the construction industry. My dream is to become a union construction worker. I'm calling on the city of Los Angeles to not only support the wage increase of $15 an hour in wage theft enforcement, but to also enforce everyone's civil rights. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Patricia Allen. I'm a journey level construction worker and Labor's Local 300, a member of the Los Angeles Black Workers Center. I support the inclusion of civil rights protection in the Wage Enforcement Division. Women, especially black women, are particularly invisible on the construction sites where I work. We only represent about 1% of the workers in, the, in, this, in this industry, and it's not because we don't, we don't want to work hard to make a living just like everybody else. But we need enforcement so that these local contractors will have to see us, women and black, black workers out there. I have a right not to be discriminated against when I apply for work, but it happens all the time. There are too many construction sites in this city alone for the state to do this work by itself. I believe things would be different if we had more local enforcement. We are counting on the city of Los Angeles to enforce laws against discrimination so that we won't have to be invisible anymore. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Gloria Medina, and I'm here representing SCOPE, Strategic Concepts for Organizing and Policy Education. We've been doing work in South LA and surrounding communities for over 20 years, specifically CD 8, 9, and 10, where we have a lot of low-wage workers who suffer from high incidence of wage theft and discrimination in the workplace. Since our reception, we have been working side by side with marginalized communities to create solutions for the lack of sustainable employment opportunities. Uh, not, not, not just for all Angelinos, but specifically for those living in poverty. Our communities need real solutions to address critical unemployment and underemployment problems. As we experience continual cost of living increase, we know that this is even more important than ever before. We know that sustainable jobs is very important for our communities. So we must, the city must stop the employees, employers from robbing workers of opportunities to access the middle class. We need comprehensive wage enforcement with civil rights protection. We need to make sure that our communities have access to employment and that they are not being robbed of the opportunity of, of climbing up uh, the career path and out of poverty. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Loretta Stevens, on behalf of the Los Angeles Black Workers Center, we want to first thank all of you guys for standing up, speaking out, and trying to address anti-discrimination violations that are happening in the city of Los Angeles. Enforcement of anti-discrimination laws in Los Angeles matters. Black workers are experiencing racist slurs and joke, jokes, quote, jokes on work sites, name biases, firings for speaking up against discriminations, wage theft and exclusion. Some employers are even refusing to accept resumes from black workers. Black workers are demanding more protections against discrimination that we are facing in LA. 18% black unemployment is unacceptable, is destroying our community. We've met with the city attorneys. We've provided information, solutions, and options to address this issue. Join the other 10 cities and do something at the local level. This show by action that black lives matter. We can do this. Thank you. Thank you. say is to this to each and every one of you and to all the groups who have worked to bring this to where it is thank you thank you thank you very much I'm so glad I'm not a working person anymore but I have to think about my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren and I just want to tell you I've sat here I've heard it all I've walked I preach I fast and hey I am here and I know when I come next week it's going to pass Thank you all. Congratulations to the city of L.A. And let's get on with the work that has to be done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, a tough act, a tough act to follow. Uh, William Kellogg, Ron Hassan, Gloria Madrina, Reverend uh, Louis Logan, Reverend Nathaniel Martin, and Ray Bray. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is William Kellogg, and I'm here to discuss the feasibility and legality of an anti-discrimination provision in the Wage Enforcement Division. No business establishment of any kind whatsoever shall discriminate against or refuse to contract with any person in the city of Los Angeles on account of their sex, race, color, religion, national origin, disability, sexual orientation, or veteran status. That sounds like something we all should support. Also sounds like a mirror image of section 51.5 of the California Civil Code, which the legislative notes indicate it is the intent of the legislature of the state of California by provision of this act not prevent this area of concern so that other jurisdictions in the state, like Los Angeles, may take actions appropriate to their concerns. I have provided you all with the relevant case law in support of this proposed wording and interpretation. Now that we see it as possible, how do we enforce anti-discrimination? In addition to partnering with state and federal agencies and community outreach, I urge that we monitor local businesses and encourage self-reporting of demographic employment data to provide evidence to support findings of systemic discrimination so we don't just affect a worker, but improve conditions thank for the entire workforce. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. 
My name is Ron Hassan. I'm with the National Board of the NAACP. I would first of all like to thank uh, Councilman Koretz, Councilman Cedillo, for their interpretation of what needs to happen in terms of a law or an Office of Labor Standards that will protect all of our citizens. Los Angeles is one of the most diverse cities in the United States. There are a number of other cities that have an Office of Labor Standards which is set up to protect all of our citizens. We know, all of these ladies and gentlemen here know, that African Americans are underrepresented in many of the labor organizations today. City employed or, or private employed organizations today. It is important that we put this process into work, Office of Labor Standards, to protect all of our citizens. We know that you can do it. We hope that you will continue to work with this in terms of putting it into place because if we do not look at enforcing these laws, there are other issues that will come down the line which will be much more costly for us. So work with us in terms of creating an Office of Labor Thank Standards. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Economic Empowerment Committee. I'm Reverend Dr. Lewis Logan. I'm the co-convener of the Black Brown Clergy Coalition, pastor of Ruach Christian Community Fellowship, and chair of the Economic Empowerment Committee of the West Area Neighborhood Council. I joined my voice with that of the editor of the Daily News and the LA Sentinel yesterday in calling for the adoption of the anti-discrimination amendment by quoting Dr. King who said, wait has almost always meant never. Justice too long delayed is justice denied. This quote by Dr. King is a reminder to this committee that you must create comprehensive protections for all LA workers now. Now is the time for anti-discrimination amendment to strengthen enforcement of the minimum wage by addressing structures around that wage. Now is the moment to protect workers' civil rights by investigating, mediating, adjudicating anti-discrimination complaints at the city level. Now is the moment to protect city workers' civil rights by investigating, mediating, and adjudicating anti-discrimination complaints and to implement enhancement administrative penalties for violations of anti-discrimination provisions. Proverbs 23, 22 and 3 says, speaks now by saying a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton blindly goes on and suffers the consequences. The time for this committee to be wise and prescient is now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. I'm Reverend Nathaniel Martin, pastor of New Life Institutional Baptist Church here in the city of Los Angeles. And as a member of the National Action uh, Network, LA chapter, Reverend uh, K.W. Tulis being the president, we want to commend the city council for taking this action and want you to know that the NAN is continuing to fight for civil rights across this nation. And we feel that here in Los Angeles that this city council has a historic opportunity. Uh, by protecting the civil rights of black workers with the current uh, black job crises and real discrimination taking place at the work site, having uh, anti-discrimination provision at the local level would be a major step for all worker protection. All work sites should look like Los Angeles. If you look today at many of the other work sites in the city, it doesn't show very much diversity. And we, would, we feel that you have the power to put a stop to exploitation, exclusion in the 21st century, include civil rights protection for LA workers now. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our, uh, our last group of speakers, Chaz Grayson, Regina Ferrer, uh, Ruben Walker, Ruth Sarnoff, Wayne from Encino, John Walsh. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address you today. My name is Regina Freer. I'm a professor of politics at Occidental College, a resident of South Los Angeles, and a member of the LA Black Worker Center Coordinating Committee. Um, I come today to urge you to create a real and effective anti-discrimination mechanism in this city. 
The black jobs crisis demands such action. We must have civil rights protection in this legislation, and we need to have that language today. Other cities do this. Uh, Baltimore does this. San Francisco does this. Seattle does this. Exploitation and exclusion go hand in hand. The same employers that exploit Latino immigrant workers exclude black employees. These practices go hand in hand, and thus we must address them at the same time if they're going to be effective. We can only think about the history of black janitors and garment workers and construction workers who were pushed out um, so that exploited immigrant labor could be ushered in. Please include provisions in the ordinance for the Office of Labor and Standards that go beyond referral, that allow us to audit, take data, so that when people do bring claims, they have that information at their disposal to pursue legal action. Protect civil rights today, raise the wage, stop wage theft, and protect civil rights Thank as you. well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your comments. My name is Ruben Walker. To you, Mr. Price, and our aldermen, city lawyers, I got a few words to say. I am a citizen. Your citizens come first. I am not Spanish. I am not white. I'm a citizen. I'm from the black workers. Back in my day, opportunity, I was there. Don't turn back the time. Bring it back up. What that gentleman sit beside you, Mr. Price, on your left, he said the same thing that I heard on the news. Angelino, he should have said citizen. That's where your problem started at. Not saying citizen, he said Angelino. Cut that out, make everybody equal, Everything be good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, now we turn to the scary part. The Wage Enforcement Division. The Office of Labor Standards. Sounds pretty ominous. I thought uh, we were all going to get together and trust one another. So now we're going to go after people now for additional things. Um, well, one thing you can do at the airport, I understand the airport's not behaving well. In the ordinance, amend it like they do in Germany. When they land the airplane, just seize the airplane. Take it. And say, all right, here we have your airplane, your $45 million airplane. Where's our check? And it's as simple as that. They do it the same way with German citizens. As soon as you get off the plane, they want you don't pay your taxes. They take you off the plane and in the Huskau. Thank you. Ruth Sarnoff. Um, I, I think you guys are going to have to really use the bully pulpit a lot to really educate all Angelinos as to all the fine nuances of this $15 uh, wage because the best uh, way to guarantee uh, support and understanding of enforcement is to get the word out everywhere you can. And that includes in the languages that are spoken here, um, the uh, using maybe your metro system ads, which could get some of the... Uh, fast food ads off of it, if it would please. Um, and know that um, everyone needs this consciousness. We have a lot of community press, uh, and you need to think of yourselves as a nerve center to help keeping the information out there. And as far as um, the uh, ports and LAX and DWP, they're semi-autonomous. Their power um, maybe should be looked at and how we deal with those agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Sulam. My name is uh, Reverend Bowie, and I'm from Holman United uh, Methodist Church. And I'm here today and want to encourage you to vote and to enforce and include the anti-discrimination wage enforcement ordinance, uh, which will help ensure the employees to have justice and that employers will not take advantage of them. I uh, also want to inform you that there is a black job crisis here in Los Angeles where 20 percent of black workers are unemployed and 32 percent of them work on jobs where they are underemployed with pay. So I want to encourage you to move forward and to take the lead as Los Angeles should being one of the uh, largest and greatest cities in our nation and even throughout the world. And I just want to thank you for taking this on and I just request that you would all just do the right thing. Have a great day. Thank you. That concludes our, our public comments uh, and I just want to thank everyone for their participation and support uh, in uh, review of, of both of these items, all three of these items. Certainly wage enforcement and anti-discrimination uh, uh, clauses are going to be very um, an important component of, uh, of raising the wage and we want to make sure that there is adequate enforcement um, and um, options available to pursue uh, any wrong actions that are taken. Um, members, is there any other uh, discussion or comment? Mr. Koretz. Yeah, just to follow up to one of the things that was mentioned about our proprietaries, I wonder if I could get the city attorney to come back up so I could ask a couple questions. So I don't have any first-hand knowledge of this, but I've heard a lot of second-hand complaints about wage theft relating to companies that we contract with at the airport. Um, is there any need to write anything into our current wage theft, wage theft ordinance that's before us to mandate that the proprietary departments are included and that if wage theft is going on at, at those departments that they're not in any way, those contractors not in any way protected and in, and in fact the reverse that we can actually perhaps suspend those contracts or take other actions um, if they're in violation. Good afternoon, Council Members. David Michelson with me, my colleague Valerie Flores. Um, Council Member Cedillo, a little bit earlier today, uh, I believe asked as one of the report backs uh, a number of questions that are focused uh, on that same um, area that you mentioned, Council Member Koretz, uh, and to sort of put uh, some flesh on the bones. The city is using its police powers to enact this law, so all workers within the city of Los Angeles um, will receive the protections and benefits provided by this law. That includes those workers who happen to be working um, on jobs uh, at, at uh, any of the three proprietaries for the city of Los Angeles, the port, the airport, DWP. So those workers certainly will, will receive the protections afforded by um, this new uh, citywide general minimum wage ordinance and the corresponding enforcement uh, ordinance. Uh, however, uh, I think your question and Councilmember Cedillo's question as well is, is well placed in that there may be some additional enforcement tools that the three proprietaries can bring to bear. If it turns out a worker uh, employed by a contractor for one of the city proprietaries is not getting their wages, if that's determined by the Bureau of Contract Administration through an investigation, um, is it possible for the three, one of the three proprietaries who holds that contract or that license or that agreement to take steps to either suspend or um, terminate that license or agreement with that contractor, with that employer? Uh, it is likely that many of these licenses and contracts with the, with the proprietary departments already has a provision that could be utilized in this way, but it is something that definitely should be looked at at the three proprietaries to see whether they should um, enhance their licenses, their contracts, their agreements to make sure that tool can be brought to bear. And this city council could encourage those proprietary departments to do just that. And this is what I think the report back will, will, will focus on to a great extent. Just to make it clear, so we don't need any report back on whether they come under this, this ordinance. 
every employer, including those at the proprietary departments, um, are, are included. This in no way the, the fact right. that they work at the airport in no way protects them it does from, not shield from them from full that's aggressive right. enforcement of, of our wage theft. Ordinance. Absolutely correct, Council Member. Thank you. One other additional measure that we could look at for the proprietaries is um, a provision that would have any employer who had been convicted of wage theft, that the, the proprietaries could take that into consideration in determining whether that contractor is a responsible contractor for purposes of an award of a bid, uh, I mean of a contract. Hopefully if we did that, it wouldn't say they could take it into account. I think that we'd have to would. say they, they must consider that as one of their, their considerations. Okay, any other comments, members? Again, I want to thank uh, everyone for your participation and for your attention. Uh, and, and again, just a reminder, this is uh, you know, part of the process, part of the ongoing process. Uh, we are still going to be uh, considering a number of other issues related uh, to the ordinance, uh, and we look forward to your involvement and your participation. Uh, but members, if there's no objection, we're going to approve the ordinance uh, as presented and request the city attorney with assistance of the CLA to report back on current anti-discrimination laws and how they can be incorporated into the city's wage enforcement ordinance as well as establishing a referral process for other public agencies uh, in addition to the uh, report backs requested by Councilman Coretz, Cedillo, and Martinez. Yes. Any further questions? Just during that period so they have a lower wage while they're... Any other questions? If seeing none, that will be the order. Madam Clerk, is there any other issue before us this afternoon? There are no further items. So for the record, I'd like to read in um, item number three earlier. A motion relative to amending recommendation number one of the Economic Development Committee report of May 5th, 2015, regarding the establishment of an Office of Labor Standards to include the additional enforcement provision H, anti-discrimination. There are no further items on today's agenda, Mr. Okay. Chair. Okay, members, seeing no other businesses at this time, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.